Hello, my name is Carol Golden, and I am the Executive Director of the Limited and Extended Care Planning Center, the LECP, as we call it at NAFA. You know, a good deal of information that is out there, I think we can consider some of it outdated. And it's important for us now to understand how many different options and solutions we have to offer clients. And with the worldwide population, shall we say maturing, we saw that with the COVID-19 pandemic, that we have a real shortage, we have a real issue that we do need to address. And it would be good not to address it as an immediate issue, but to address it so that we can plan, better plan. So because I'll be referring to some tax uh, issues, tax solutions, I want to remind you that we are not a tax firm and therefore for any of that information, you should consult with your own tax. And we'll be using some of One America's um, illustrations and ideas. So again, this is their disclosure. So what is it that we would like to do today together? Well, to begin with, I hope that you'll walk away feeling that you've gotten some education and support that you need to start doing more planning. And that you'll have some insights on ways that you can approach the topic and integrate it into your client conversations. Finally, let's engage in a case study together and see how we can be really impactful generational advisors. But you know, knowing is not enough and being willing is not enough. We really must make sure that we're the ones that help people to move forward and to plan. So as Rosalind Carter said, better than I can possibly say, there's only four kinds of people in the world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who need caregiving. So that kind of brings us to the question of who is actually affected by this caregiving issue? Well, I saw a really interesting study that was done by the Society of Actuaries Long-Term Care Center. Actually, it's a section. And in that, they discussed um, how this would affect a couple. In other words, the contagion of when someone is needing care and what impact that has on the next person needing care. Care. So the results of the study indicated that what happens is the person who is currently needing care um, gets the care from the spouse, but that spouse needs care sooner than any other, any other person in the same age and physical condition. So if we move on to um, our families affected, and friends are affected, as well as the community that gets affected, our business associates, because we do talk about these issues amongst ourselves, and the states. Well, let's take a moment to say that certainly COVID-19 showed us that the states in many cases are ill-prepared for handling extended and long-term care. And with some 79 boomers, and a good number of Gen Xers right behind, there is going to be a volume issue. There is going to be a training issue. And what about the federal government? Well, I'd like to take a moment to talk about how the 1996 HIPAA, and HIPAA is the Health Insurance Protection and Accountability Act. And that was the act that actually created the tax qualified long-term care qualifications. And there are two ways in a policy that you can trigger the benefits, and that is established by HIPAA. The first way is called the activities of daily living. And they are kind of think about 
like when you get up in the morning, what do you do? Well, to begin with, you get out of bed, and that's called transferring. Next um, is incontinence, so that's another trigger. Next is toileting individually without help. That's the third trigger. After that, maybe you take a shower. So um, you would be bathing, and that's the next trigger. Then let's say you get dressed. So dressing independently, sixth trigger. And then, of course, you would have to be able to eat as well. So that's, um, that's the sixth trigger. The other trigger is being, um, uh, involves cognizant impairment. And if you're determined to have two out of six of the activities of daily living or cognizant impairment, then you can trigger the contract. So what exactly do we look at when we're planning? Because when we plan today for clients, that will become their history tomorrow. So for the boomers, we often hear that 10,000 boomers are turning 70 every day. Now, for those that are in the beginning of the boomer generation, they're probably not particularly insurable. So we'll go through some of those options later as well. Maybe the younger ones still are. And the Gen Xers, well, according to the US Census Bureau, by 2020, nearly 140 million people will be aged 45 and over. So this actually represents people that we should definitely be educating and helping to understand how impactful a plan can be. And certainly COVID-19 makes that an easy conversation for all of us. And then there's the millennials. Well, in the year 2020, there's actually 3.5 working millennials, or at least there was <laughs> before uh, COVID-19, um, which is only going to exacerbate that they say by 2060, we'll only have 2.5 working individuals to contribute towards those who are age 65 and older, and we're assuming that they are obviously uh, retiring. So for the Gen Xers and the millennials, and in some cases for these boomers, the issue is adding caregiving to their already busy work schedules and family schedules. So I know I've used some statistics, but I wanna point out that these aren't just statistics. This is a trend and this trend does promise to continue. Sorry. Well, first we wanna look at the distribution and duration of long-term care centers. To begin with, it's notable that the average number of years people use this type of care, any kind of service that is, is three years. And you'll notice that it's a good 69% that use it. The other thing I think is worth noting here is what kind of care? At home, elsewhere, paid care? The point is they use any care at home is two years. And I'm sure that you agree with me that asking anybody where they would like to age, the answer is I wanna age in place. So now let's look at the costs that are attached to that. Uh, Genworth puts out this cost of care study and Genworth is part of the NAFA Limited and Extended Care Planning Center. So they've offered us this chart. And as you can see on the chart, the nursing home costs have gone up super um, expensive now. And I don't know about you, but it was one thing to have a college random roommate for a freshman year. <clears throat> but I doubt very much that when you're older and not feeling your best, that you really want to have a random roommate. So that's why we land on the private room instead of the shared facilities. The other thing I think I'd like you to make note of is the home aid went up a little under 2% and the homemaker went up a little over 2%. So I would just ask you, 
to look at the 2019 costs, I mean, it's already 50,000 plus, and we see that there is really, really a shortage of people who are going to help us in those positions. And I think at this point, we need to focus on what are the costs going to become? So if we take the 102 or a private room and we um, multiply it out by 20 years, and then we look at the average number of years for men, which is 2.2, we see that the cost could be as high as 447,000. And if we do the same for the women, it's all the way up to 7. Point, I'm sorry, 752,000 because it's 3.7 years. Now that's an average. And if we're unlucky enough to have someone in our family or in our friends who are suffering from Alzheimer's, that cost can be as high as a million 600,000. I want to share with you that my mother-in-law went into assisted living at the age of 89. She then progressed to need more care. And when she died at 99, we had actually spent 1.2 million on her care. And it was worth it, but it's a lot of money. So now let's talk about how we would get clients to talk to us about this. Sharing those kinds of statistics is the way to actually turn them off because statistics don't help people understand. What helps is when we listen to their story. We don't share necessarily our information, but we want to listen to what they have to say. And that is truly the way marketing of products is done nowadays. And that's especially true for long-term care. So we're going to change the conversation and remember that we have two ears and one mouth for a good reason. And we're going to remember that because as we hear their story, what are we listening for? Well, we're trying to gauge their level of motivation. Uh, we're trying to figure out how much they really know. And is their knowledge from, I heard it on the internet, or is their knowledge based on somebody told me, or I've done this research with someone else. All of that is important, and you're going to be able to take that as fact-finding. Now, it's also important to know, did you bring up the topic? Did they bring up the co topic? Was there a reason that all of a sudden, maybe they had a COVID-19 incident, and it has really made them think about planning? And that would be good. Maybe they went to the doctor who gave them some news that wasn't so good, and that would not be very good. So let's do this. Let's move on into our case study. This is a case study where we have the matriarch, Nicole, and she has her mother, Nora, who is her mom, but is also grandma to Nicole's daughter, Joan, and her daughter, Nicolette, both of whom are married and both of whom have children. So here you are, you're going to be talking to them and you make an arrangement to speak to both of them together because that's what they would want to do. I mean, you wouldn't want to talk to Nicole's mother without Nicole being around or at least not when you really were sitting down to become their generational advisor. Because Nicole is the matriarch of the family, so she wants to be included. Besides, her mother is a little dependent on her already. So what are you going to do during the conversation? I have found the most effective thing to do is to get a file, one for Nicole, one for Nora, and one for each daughter. Because some of the information we're going to hear during these stories are going to be useful in the different files. So for example, on Nora, we would want to know about first category, her current health. So Nora says that she's in excellent health. And then Nicole jokes that her mother is not as steady on her feet as she used to be. And in fact, 
I'm telling you that one of the statistics that I have noted is that every 11 seconds, a person over 65 winds up in the emergency room because of a fall. It is very common. Now, Nora also has a sister. Her sister is much older than her, and she's living in a CCRC, and that stands for a Continuing Care Retirement Community. So what else do we need to know? Well, we need to know about Nora's finances. So we find out that Nora has Medicare and she has a Medicare sub. Um, but I think at that point, Nicole jokes a little and says, yeah, mom, but whenever something has to be filled out, you either ask me or you ask one of the girls, meaning Joan or Nicolette. Okay. That's more good information for us. We also know that Nora collects Social Security and she has some small savings and some investments, which throw off a very little bit of income for her. Now, Nora leaves the room for a moment and Nicole mentions that she is getting concerned because her mother is getting more and more dependent upon her. And Nicole is and has been trying very hard to qualify for a promotion at work. And she is concerned that if she becomes more involved in her mother's care, that one, she won't be able to qualify for that promotion. Two, that her savings on her 401k because of having to take time off and other um, duties that she may have She's concerned that her 401k, her own retirement, will be impacted. And then she's also concerned because she knows that not having um, income gradually increase will also maybe negatively impact her Social Security benefits. So this is things that the generational advisor is now noting, but it'll go in Nicole's file. Nora comes back in and the advisor asks, well, where is it that you are going to be receiving care? Nora proudly announced that she and her husband bought this house and have lived in it and have paid off their mortgage. What does that signify? Well, they own the house. The house has now become much more valuable over the years and her husband was really pretty handy and was able to keep it in pretty good shape. Nora mentions that with her husband gone now, she's had to start hiring the teenage boys and some other people to kind of help her with things that her husband used to do. Another important point. Now, as for mobility, Nicole mentions that Nora, I had mentioned actually that Nora's not that steady on her feet. But then Nora herself says, you know, if we have to go somewhere, I'm, I'm no longer into highway driving. I call either my granddaughter Joan or my granddaughter Nicolette, but of course they're pretty busy themselves with their own kids. Then we would ask about insurances. Well, Nora proudly announces that she has 120,000 whole life policy but she carefully adds that she is absolutely intending to leave that to her granddaughter, Joan, and the other Nicolette. She has no long-term care insurance and she has no DNR, you know, do not resuscitate. She has a will, but she hasn't updated it for 15 years. And this is kind of common, you know, you're just making notes, listening to the story of how she and her husband bought the house and paid off the house and did a will, you asked when, 15 years ago. And then of course they move on to, um, aside from documentation, what are some of the things that now you might try to put the conversation in that direction? You already know that Nora kind of has longevity on her side, but you don't know much about her family health history. And it would be very helpful to know that aside from longevity, um, you might ask about her mom and dad. Again, people like to tell a story 
and they like to talk about their past and so on and so forth. Now you as the financial advisor, you're making a difference here in your notes about what's an asset and what's income. Because as we get to the point of retirement, or in this case, past retirement, most people have a lot of information on accumulating. But when it comes to distribution and using that money in different ways, not so much. So we want to know um, if there's any other investment advisor that they've been talking to. Listen carefully to how they tell you about things. And we have heard about um, Nicole's concern about her retirement plan. So we need to understand the underwriting impacts because a lot of long-term care products and some critical illness products are going to be underwritten. So the health history is important. And knowing their knowledge and understanding is important because you don't know if they've already decided what the solution would be. And you're going to have to find out if that's actually going to be the best solution or options, I should say. And the retirement picture is something you would really be concerned about for Nicole, the matriarch. So now let's move to aligning our client motivations with some options. And honestly, when you're trying to talk to them, um, what you're trying to do is one of the basic tenets of, of human behavior is to care about things that directly affect us or people that we care about. So you have to ask yourself, did her story that I just told you, did it include any clues as to whether she understands any options? Is she familiar with any options? Did she indicate that moving in with her sister in the CCRC was an option for her? Or did she say she wanted to stay at home? She seemed to indicate that she's very proud of owning that home. So we don't know when speaking to a client whether any of these would be important to them because if in fact um, she has her income and her savings and the stock market is down and you're forced to use those, it, it could be unfortunate. So a risk, in my opinion, is when someone does not fear the consequences or in some cases even understand the consequences, well, you know where that goes on your list, that goes all the way down to number 10 on a list of 10. So it's important that you look at some of these motivators and say, okay, are any of these going to be something that you need to weave into the conversation so that you can move from conversation to, so we need obviously to look at options and see what's going to work best here. Maybe you need to motivate the matriarch because Nora, we know, is dependent upon her. So we know also that there's no such thing as a perfect solution. Sorry about that. <laughs> but what is missing from this list? Well, you need to know who is going to be involved in the contract. Um, and you need to know when the contract is going to kick in. You need to know where it's going to allow anybody to have help. In other words, is this contract going to provide as much for home care as it is if she decides that she wants to go into assisted living? How is the contract triggered? Now we know, we discussed, that if it's a qualified plan, she has to meet two of the six ADLs. And we know that if it's a non-qualified plan, the state is going to indicate what is the triggers. Um, but we also have to know um, what it does without forgetting that we also have to know what it doesn't do. And for how, I would say we have to remember to look at the option and say, how long does this provide for care? 
So let's now move to some of the options. What if they decide uh, to self-insure? Well, even wealthy people quite often look at self-insurance and they're very aware of leveraging their money. They're very aware of some of the tax impacts that you saw when we were looking at motivating the client, for example. So for many people, they have now qualified um, to start an H HSA. Sorry about that. So qualifying, if you have a high deductible health plan, you can open an HSA. There are some exceptions, but let's just say that in our case, Nicole, the matriarch, has an HSA. She has opened it. She has been funding it. Now, normally, HSAs cannot be used to pay insurance premiums. But fortunately, one of the exceptions to that, and it's listed in the IRS publication number 502, which lists these allowable expenses, well, long-term care premiums are listed there. And later, when Nicole is who you're talking to, we'll kind of weave that into one of her options. I also want to just touch on the government programs. And one of the reasons I say just touch on it is one of our LECP sponsors specializes in Medicare and Medicaid. And we all know that it varies from state to state. The one thing that Nicole brings up um, is that she saw that Medicare has added long-term services and supports to Medicare. First of all, they only added it as Medicare Part C, not the original Medicare. So the question is, which does her mother have since she's been on Medicare for a while? And um, if she went on Medicaid, would, would she really want to have the government determining her mother's care? And would her mother want that? So I consider that a specialized area, and it's good to network and have a specialist. I think in general, your generation advisor is not a jack of all trades, but he is a specialist in knowing options and knowing how to get a client to choose an option that is going to work for them, not just a cookie cutter option. So moving on to the vet's benefits, again, at NAFA's LECP, I use a specialist. But one of the things that was notable that happened recently in 2019 is I think many people know to qualify for Medicaid, you have a what they call a five-year look-back rule, which means that if you transfer an asset within five years of applying for Medicaid, they take the amount of that asset and it figures into the qualifying time. It's a penalty period, actually, before you can collect from Medicaid. Well, in the case of the veterans' benefits, that was never part of it, but now it is. Now there is a three-year look-back rule for um, qualifying for having benefits paid by the vet system. What we're hearing here is that these are viable options for the right client. Nora mentions that her husband was a vet and would it be possible that she'd qualify? I'm telling you she probably wouldn't, but what I would do is consult a specialist so I could give her a succinct, smart, well-informed answer. Let's move on now and say, what option do you think Nicole and Nora would want to explore with the advisor? So let's review. Borrow from an existing life insurance policy. Well, we know that she has a 120,000 whole life policy, which has nice cash buildup. But we also know that she was very strong in telling us she wants to leave it to her grandchildren. Well, what if we went for a life insurance settlement option? Again, those are available either through a broker or through directly through a company that does life settlements. 
life settlements have become much more regulated. Again, LECP has a specialist on that. Why? Because in it, as a generational advisor, if this was an option for someone in the family that didn't need insurance anymore, they might want to look into that. That's very different from a viatical life insurance option. With the viatical, you're expected to pass away within two years, and they give you a percentage of the death benefit. All in all, none of these options are good for Nicole and Nora because none of them suit what we heard from them in terms of what Nora wants to do with her existing policy. So that leaves us with the reverse mortgage. Well, since she wants to stay in her home, we need to look at reverse mortgages and say, well, would this be an option? So at this point, Nicole says, you know, I think I'll have my daughters sit in if you're going to bring in a specialist for us. And so that's exactly what we do. We bring in a specialist and the specialist lets us know that reverse mortgages are now um, rely on mortality credit like actuarial principles. So no borrower can ever owe more than the value of the home, regardless of how long Nora lives there or what the value of the home should become. That becomes of greater interest now to this family because she has this, what I call a buffer asset that can give her funds. She can uh, look at the last option way on the right here, the LOC. She can get a line of credit so that if she doesn't need the money immediately, it is there. What if she takes a spill? What if she does need extended care? We know Nicole is working. We know the other uh, two are also working and have children. So now we're interested in saying, well, this belongs to Nora, Nora and this is an option that lets her age in place, which is what she wants to do. And it also provides the family with a way of letting her use her asset in a way that will still let her pass the house on, but gives her the funds that she may need. By now, most of the family members have become involved in the plan. So one of the girls and Nicole says, why don't we talk about you, mom, before you get to the point um, you don't own your own home. So are there options for you? At least we could look at some of them. So of course, that brings us to the insurance options. I hope by looking at this particular slide, you start to see that there might be a few options here that you're not all that familiar with, but that might fit that client who is involved in a family in one way or the other. Let's first talk a little bit about traditional long-term care. Traditional long-term care, or TLTC as we call it, is still going to probably give you the most focused care for any extended or long-term care need. Um, most people have heard that um, traditional long-term care has huge rate increases and um, it's gotten very bad press. Well, it's true. The um, actuaries based um, the lapsation rate, which is how many people just don't use or claim on a policy, just drop the policy, if you will, and on the interest that can be earned. Well, we all know that interest rates 20 years ago were much better than the non-interest rates that we practically have now. And we also know that for most carriers, um, I think they thought it would be between a four and a 6% lapsation rate, when in fact, in most cases, it's less than 1%. So the new policies have all that information, have all that history, and they know now how to better price these policies, and therefore they still are a very viable option. And speaking of 
who we're talking to here, now we're talking to Nicole, Joan, and maybe her daughter, Nicolette. These are all people who are at work along with their husbands. So what about group and multi-life? Well, when I was very involved in group sales, I have to say that there are three ways that you can approach that. I worked with a property and casualty uh, office and I worked with a CPA because in dealing with the businesses, this is something where it's called an executive carve out and they can choose who they want to have in the plan. They can pay for those people without having that person counted as income. There is no limit on the amount allowed. For example, with life insurance after 50,000, it has to be imputed as income. And like with um, disability, when the money comes to you, if it's an employer paid program, you then have to pay taxes on it. Not true with long-term care. So you can see that for companies that do have the funds, this is a very significant uh, group layout. Now there's the second way of doing it is called a core plan where the employer pays for everybody, a base core, and then the employees can buy up. The third way is a totally voluntary um, layout. And again, we have a specialist who can, well, frankly, they split it, but they do almost 100% of the work so that you can have the client feel that, again, you're the advisor. You're not a person who's just selling a product. Now, I think we should move on to the hybrid because that's the hot market at the moment. So let's go through some of the basics in um, asset-based. To begin with, they're called asset-based because it's either the life policy or the annuity that is the base, and then the riders are put on top of it. Now, it is very important for you to understand that the riders, that is the long-term care rider versus the chronic illness rider, they are under two different codes. The long-term care rider comes under 7702B. And as we saw in the beginning, that was established by the 1996 HIPAA Act, and that indicates the triggers and quite a few other things. Agents have to have the right training. Advisors have to have the long-term care training for those. The second one is the chronic illness rider. And that one is 101G. And I, I, I think it's important for us to absolutely understand the differences um, between them. For example, um, a chronic illness is, um, how shall I put this? It's one that lasts a long time. It's typically longer than three months, by the way. And it's an illness that has no medical cure and doesn't go away by itself. And then there are certain chronic illness riders that exclude certain illnesses. Either way, they're both called accelerated death benefits because they provide tax-free cash advances from this base policy while the client is alive. And we will go through some examples when we pop back to our case study. I also wanted to mention this EOB, which is, an, ooh, I'm sorry, which is an extended death benefit. Um, because some people were concerned that if you used a life policy for long-term care and it got exhausted and you still needed care, what would happen? So these extension of benefit policies, there's basically three different types. Again, the devil's in the details. So if it's not your forte, this is information that either you can contact me or we can get you with a specialist who can help you understand when and where it would fit with a client. Finally, I wanna mention the 1035 exchange. And all I want to say here is that whether it's a life policy 
um, um, an annuity, a long-term care policy or endowment contract, a 1035 exchange lets you exchange it for a like type contract. And when we get to our examples, um, because some of the family members are now asking about them and they're younger and they're insurable, it's important to remember that some of these are good even for new coal. If you have cash built up in one of them, there is a way of using that to come out as a long-term care benefit and thus not be taxable. In meeting with the rest of the family, the advisor decides that he doesn't know, he hasn't had the opportunity to hear their stories or totally understand the direction they may want to go. And one of the LECP sponsors gave me this, and they use this when approaching some of their clients or helping their advisors who say, look, we have no idea. But what are some of the pros and cons? So it's good for you to decide in a made up form like this, what's important in terms of pros and cons? Now, one of the things that let's say Nicole and her daughter Joan asked about was the different chronic illness versus the long-term care rider. And I know that this is something that you're not able to zip through and read while we are spending our time together. But I did want you to see that there are distinct differences between the two. So during our meeting with um, Nicole and her daughters, one of the sons, son-in-laws, says, so I would like to know the difference between, say, the indemnity and the reimbursement program. So it's good to use an example, which is what I did here. So let's say Tyson, who is the son-in-law, of Nicole says, show me if I had a claim, what would happen? So if we look, Tyson under the reimbursement gets $12,000 worth of long-term care expenses. That's 12,000 because he has the receipts for that. And in February, he only has 8,000. So he winds up with the total of those two months of 20,000. Now let's look down at the indemnity rider. They have uh, a 2% of the death benefit. The death benefit, as you can see, is 750,000. So in January, Tyson has the 12,000. So if you divide that into a daily benefit, there are 31 days in the month of January. So $370 times the 31, you come up with the 11,000. For February, 370 times 28, you come up with the 10,000. As you can see, he got a little more money in terms of the indemnity rider. I think the important thing here for you to note is that either way, the $750,000 death benefit will be reduced by the amount of the benefits received. So some people like the reimbursement because it will, they think, last longer or it's easier for them to budget with it. It's very personal. So now Nicole says, well, okay, I am interested in one of these hybrid products and I have an HSA. So what would I be able to deduct? So what we do now is we look at, we get a quote and we see that her premium would be um, the $3,500 a year. For her HSA, she would look at the acceleration rider, the extension of benefit rider, the inflation protection rider. And as you can see, that inflation protection rider is expensive. So even though some companies have added them to the chronic illness riders, uh, it's a shock when you give it to people. If we add up the 142, the 214, the 1752, we come up with our answer that it's 2,108. Now, this advisor knows that that's not the whole answer. He has to go back and look at the age bands that are published that work with how much you can take out of the HSA. So for Nicole, who is 53, 55, whatever, 
the age band of 51 to 60 allows her to deduct the entire $2,108 from her HSA. Here's another practical application just for the um, heck of it. Let's say that she has a friend, she works with this friend and the friend says to her, hey, um, I'm closer to retirement than you are. And so, you know, I'm a little interested in what possible layout that I could have. Do you think your guy would be willing to chat with me? Well, so here's an idea for him there. She has a lot of qualified assets. So you could take a small portion of that qualified asset and create a multi-pay premium that can be used to purchase a linked benefit. Maybe instead of a lump sum, they want to do it on an annual basis for tax reasons and so on and so forth. So now suppose Nicole said, well, I have a $100,000 annuity. What would work for me? Well, looking at the um, illustration here, we could say, well, you have a $50,000 cost basis and a $50,000 taxable gain. If we take that $100,000 annuity and we do the 1035 exchange, remember we discussed that a little earlier, you could get a $100,000 annuity with a basis of uh, an annuity that has a long-term care rider. And because you can leverage the amount that would be used, the 2% or the 3% for long-term care, you now have a tax-free long-term care benefit. So if she had taken it out after she exhausts her cost benefit on the left here, she would have to be paying taxes on that second 50,000. But this whole thing has given her a tax-free way. If the money has to come out for long-term care, it comes out tax-free. Now I'd like to move on and ask a question here, which I have to answer, I guess, with you. Um, why wouldn't the generational advisors select a, a SPIA, a single premium immediate annuity for Nora? Well, that's easy. We know that Nora doesn't have that kind of um, funds that she would need to use. Plus, her health is pretty good. But what if your client um, isn't that healthy and is concerned about his situation? So SPIAs can be used when they need guaranteed premiums, when um, they are not considered insurable for other options, um, there's no account management, uh, there's no requirement. And if it's a sick person who doesn't have anybody who is going to be helping them financially, this will be a good setup because things will come out uh, on a schedule and um, it does avoid for seniors, that's the other attraction, the uh, fluctuations that we could see in the stock market. What about short-term care? Well, there's two things that I would say about that. Uh, most people don't consider this as part of a plan, but if a client's looking at traditional long-term care, you can take a short-term care plan. It lasts a year, pretty and for affordable. I've looked at some quotes and you could reduce um, the cost of the traditional long-term care by taking a much longer elimination period and use this. Another use of the short-term care. Well, it gives the family a little time to get themselves organized because sometimes there's a lot of expenses. Look at COVID, boom, all of a sudden, there were a lot of expenses. So this would provide that while they spend time getting better organized for a plan for maybe longer term care or whatever it is that they'll need going forward. Then there's term insurance now with this ADBE, which is Accelerated Death Benefit Endorsements. And um, they are for terminal illnesses, is, is of course, meaning 24 months or less. Um, the actual amount received, and this is a little tricky. So again, 
you would want to speak to an expert because the face amount accelerated is uses a discount so that um, it's it's not tit for tat as we saw with a couple of the other examples where the face amount is reduced by the exact amount that comes out for long-term care. But this is a growing market and I have a feeling we're going to see more and more innovation here. So at this point, what I'm saying is that we have a lot of options. We have a lot of information that um, we have gathered at NAFA on different um, ways of approaching this particular topic. As you can see, you can call me on my cell or you can email me at cgolden at nafa.org and um, I can get you more in-depth experience. Oh, I'm sorry, the experience you'll have to do on your own, but I can get you in-depth uh, information and in touch with specialists. So what are some of those specialists? Well, obviously, near and dear to my heart is NAFA's LECP Center, which we're growing and we're expanding. Um, but for example, when we said that Nora could stay at home, I did a, um, a presentation for at NAFA the other day, and it included all of the technology, the robots, the um, the clothing that are being uh, created, uh, very innovative things are coming our way. So uh, it's a growing industry because obviously, just like Nora, and I suppose like Nicole and the rest of the family there, they want to age in place. No random roommates for them. Then there's the CLTC. CLTC is a sponsor of the LECP Center. And this is a top rated designation. I am a CLTC, and it really takes you through much more than just a cookie cut of long-term care. You will discover lots of different financial things that are involved in planning. Also, uh, NAFA now has the LACP, not to be mixed up with LECP, but this is a Life Underwriter Training Fellow they now have a new international certification and it will uh, be something that you can visit when you see the um, website there. And if it's interesting to you to gather that kind of further knowledge and to use your knowledge to gain a um, designation that is uh, one of a very few that are recognized, uh, I would encourage you to go there. And finally, just to wrap up, I can list a few of the resources that I have used um, during this presentation. And I tried to give you an overview that there is not just one approach. There are ways to incorporate from the storytelling all these different approaches, all the ways that you can inspire people. The bottom line is we want them to plan. I think that seeing what's gone on recently really is helpful. And I respect universities and other organizations that are trying very much to bring this information to you, bring the resources to you, so that you can then turn around and say, okay, I really understand how important it is for every generation, we went through those impacts and every generation is impacted. So when you're doing any kind of extended care, short-term, long-term, it's a generational issue. It's a family issue, a community issue. And we need you to approach it in a very broad sense. Find out how to help people do the planning that they do need. So. I wanna thank you for your time. I want to hope that you will feel free to contact me. Um, I know we can't do a Q&A because <laughs> obviously uh, that's not possible today, but it's important that if you have questions that we provide you with those answers. Thank you so much for your time today. Stay well. <laughs>